分心碎。Hi everyone.、Um, I'm very glad to see you again for this fourth episode of Extraordinary Architectural Challenges. Hi Roberto, and we we can't hear you. Yeah, please, please. Okay, great. So I want to welcome everyone to this new episode of Extraordinary Architectural Challenges by Medellin, which we are proud partner of. And of course, I want to thank you very much for inviting me as moderator this time too. So it's always a pleasure to discover amazing architectural studios like this one, which I'm going to introduce very soon. Just a couple of words about myself. My name is Patrick Abattista, and I am the founder of Design Wanted. Which is a design magazine, international design magazine based in Milan. So today, as I was saying, we will introduce the fourth episode of Extraordinary Architectural Challenges by Medellin, and I'm very, very proud to introduce you our today guest Yuki Ikeguchi, if I pronounced it correctly, who is partner at Kengo Kuma and Associates in Tokyo, and also executive vice president. At Kuma and Associates Europe in Paris, so we will talk today about the new Terrazze Verdi project by Kengo Kuma and Associates, which is a mixed-use building in the northeast of Milan. So we feel very close to to this project, also because we we are based in Milan as well. And、uh, let's say that the main parts of these projects are the, is the fact that it proposes natural elements and organic materials. That、uh, get inspiration from, of course, the surrounding landscape. But、uh, Yuki, I, of course, I'm so super curious to hear from your own words more about Terrazze Verdi. So I think that we can maybe launch the video, and then we can get back with the, yeah, with the first question think, for Yuki. I, I only interrupt just to say yeah, only、uh, hello also to our our attendees, Patrick, because、uh, today we have、uh, attendees from twenty、uh, five different countries、uh, of the world. So it's very important result. And uh, uh, my name is Roberto Cunio. I'm the, I'm the founder of、uh, Midland, and for me today is such an honor to host、uh, on our platform.、Uh, It's such an important、uh, episode of extraordinary hosting one of the most iconic practice in the world as、uh, Kengo Kuma and Associates with、uh, the partner Yuki Ikeguchi, and、uh, I want only to thank to say a big thank you to our sponsor because、uh, it thanks to them that、uh, we can also create uh, this uh, streaming, and I want to remind that this series extraordinary is created by. The architect is one specialist of Medellin, who is、uh, Marisa Cos, and of course, thank you also to our media partner, Design、uh, uh, Wanted. So I don't want、uh, to take time、uh, for the content and the very good content and the our guests, and so I give back the floor to Patrick. I hope you can enjoy the streaming. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, Roberto. Just I want just to remind the guests and the followers of this webinar that they can turn and change the language. At the bottom of the screen, so they can choose the interpretation and the, the, the favorite language, so English, Chinese, or Italian in this case. And yes, I think that we can definitely start with this video, and then we will、uh, ask our first question to Yuki. And so we can go with the video. Thank <laughs> you. 
well, it's always, you know, emotional to see these high quality renders and feels like it's already there, the building. Yuki, I welcome you once more to this webinar. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here with us today. And, you know, I will start with a very uh, basic question, which is always what I wonder when I see a new project. What is the driving inspiration behind Terrazza Verde? Uh, I would like to share some uh, uh, screen then, just to have a good introductions and walk through the project with the visuals. But first off, uh, I'm Yuki, and I'm very honored and uh, appreciative of the opportunity given for participating in this uh, great event, and very excited to share some of our work uh, with all of you. So thank you again. Um, Okay, I hope you can see my screen well. We do. Great. Uh, maybe I can start off by introducing some of the concept because uh, Terrazza Verde, which is uh, it's the project name is Welcome. Um, that is completely in line with our belief in practicing architecture and creating architecture. Um, so first off, to introduce some of the core belief that I've been trying to practice for all the projects uh, here. So first one is the biophilic architecture. Um, we believe strongly in achieving this and uh, the design with organic materials and elements that appeals to our uh, senses and tendency to find comfort inspirations uh, in the natural settings. So all the projects we try as much as possible, as many as possible, to utilize the natural materials and employ natural materials in a unique manner, but also materials such as uh, natural lights, uh, air, and green are uh, most uh, one of the most uh, precious materials to play with, but fully integrated into the architecture. What makes our architecture quite unique and distinctive towards the biophilic approach. So that's a very fundamental and first approach. A second, I would say it's a life between buildings uh, because us and as an architect, uh, we need to be very uh, careful placing the buildings in the given site because it's not just to create the space for the users or what might be occupied in the space, but it is, uh, it is creating another life in between the adjacent buildings and the city. So, uh, only to be very careful and to delicately implement the newly uh, designed project as an intervention between the buildings and to create another set of life. So open area that has a lot to do with public and the common spaces are as equally important as to create the, a beautiful and comfortable space inside. Lastly is what makes our architecture distinctive, I believe, is the micro macro simultaneous scale approach, meaning that we place a great importance in details and what makes the uh, texture appeal to the space and makes the space complete. At the same time, flying overview of an understanding in urban scale, uh, which relates to the previous uh, core belief that the life in between buildings in the urban context, it does matter equally. So this micro scale um, of the, uh, the human scale and versus the urban scale, the macro, uh, to consider it simultaneously while we initiate the design is very fundamental to our practice here. And that leaves us to the focus of Terrazza Verde. Of course, it's an exact, the completely in extension of uh, in line with our beef, but at the same time, we do believe the, um, the architecture design is a beautiful solution, must be a beautiful solution to a problems or raised visions and the expectation uh, that is specific to its side, specific to uh, um, clients with vision. So in Terrazza Verde, uh, to answer your question, <laughs> the inspiration derived from uh, the uh, core belief of our practice, but in response to the site uh, context. It's in the close proximity to this beautiful park in uh, Parco Rambro, which has this beautiful uh, greenery, which is very lush and very wild. And it's not like a formal uh, park, but taking a stroll down, you almost feel like you're walking in the woods. 
uh, even if it's in the uh, quite uh, close to the center of uh, Milan city, you still have this uh, opportunity to enjoy uh, good weekends and taking a stroll uh, in the park. So that uh, proximity to the park is uh, one of the inspiration for us to derive as close as possible to come uh, in harmony with this uh, natural setting of the park. Uh, the other two, the inspirations to drive this architecture is, uh, is the scale also, um, because the site, as Patrick introduced, is uh, situated in the uh, northeast side, uh, which is not exactly central central, it's less dense. It's uh, the site uh, have more uh, uh, spread uh, areas that we can play with. Uh, so for the office typology, we don't have to uh, build the towers. The verticality is not the uh, must or the only solutions to response to build the uh, office building. As you can see, the adjacent uh, uh, site, it has this abundance of a void, the open space, which we took as a, we took advantage of this and expanded to the best we can so that the office space, each one of the spaces can enjoy the exterior um, airs and, and lights and so on. So and that was uh, quite inspiring at the given uh, site condition. Uh, and the last is, of course, the client vision. Clients, uh, particularly the client and the Mr. Napoleone leading the uh, Europa Resource has the greatest vision. It's not just the office, but it really must contribute for innovative spaces and the uh, everyday life quality. So that was, uh, of course, taken as an inspiration to explore further. And uh, we believe that matches to uh, completely to our uh, solutions that we provide for a uh, biophilic approach. So step by step, uh, the first, it's at the site context. Um, it's approachable by the major transportation, the public transportation. So metro station is right there in the line of a uh, straight line to the uh, to approach to the uh, Parco Alhambra. So our site is sort of in on a, on a way to reach the park. So we have highlighted this corner, which is a, a quite large boulevard with the heavy traffic, um, relatively uh, high traffic, and the pedestrian ways are crossing uh, the site. So this has the very prominent corners that welcoming uh, the visitors are uh, from all uh, size, uh, from uh, vehicular access as well as pedestrian and public transportation. So highlighting this corner, the importance, we play with the two different uh, scales. One is the private scale, human scale, uh, that appeals to the neighbor, neighboring uh, residential buildings. And also to echo or respond in the dialogue with the adjacent uh, um, office building plot that has some essence of radicality. So in result of this, uh, the spread volumes, rather horizontal spread volumes that we have provided the, uh, the solution of, um, this has allowed us to put quite a large surface of greenery, both along this uh, pedestrian Casaniga, the Via Casaniga, and also the Via di Soli, which is more the wider street. Uh, to be able to welcome the visitors uh, through the greens and through full of lights. Uh, adjacent to the site uh, of the uh, um, office building complex, uh, we place the office entry. So it's rather a private uh, exclusive entry, but once it turns around the project has this uh, separate entries, but still accessible to public, defining semi-private and then completely uh, uh, public, that is open to this uh, public piazza. And the building volume starts higher uh, towards the um, adjacent side of the office block. Also, this is to conclude a sort of a, a private needs not to be uh, mixed with too much with the public eye, uh, the view lines. So uh, putting the higher buildings in response to the adjacent building scale is what was making sense. And uh, it building goes down and spread horizontally, like uh, the finger configuration, that it gets lower and lower, cascading down towards the uh, human scale and tree scale of the park uh, beyond. And there's some dynamics added to the, to the space that is mixed use for uh, commercial as well as the um, office use. Uh, so as you can see, it's not uh, typical 
uh, office typology, but it is rather uh, dynamic and also very low. And we has a lot of variations in the angles of the views and the space proportion and so on. So in a way, it's not the space, the rational repetitious space uh, is it's not at all, but it challenged, challenges that the uh, stereotypical uh, office typology, but breaks instead for uh, um, to, um, to appeal to more like a biophilic you know, architecture, eventually that uh, appeals to this uh, uh, forward thinking uh, creative firms as a tenant. So that was the aim together that we've created uh, with the client, Europa Resources. Great, Yuki, thank you for, for giving us these first insights. And you know, this brings me to the second question that I have, which is uh, about the intervention that will address not only the building site, but mm -hmm. also the outside area. I um, was wondering what strategy will you put in place in order to realize, to realize the balanced integration between, of course, the architectural design, the space, and also the landscape. You were talking about biophilic design. We see a lot of greenery, so I was mm -hmm. curious to know more. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, exactly our intention, to integrate beauty outside to inside and vice versa. So as uh, so you can see in result of this uh, site analysis and observation, uh, the building, uh, as it's, it's not a single mass, single extrusions of the vertical volumes, but rather it's a horizontally spread with the unique uh, dynamic um, appeal of the expression by fanning or the shifting of these uh, volumes, which is in intention of um, the cascading green surfaces that becomes actually in harmony with the uh, parkourando. So um, that the tenants, each one of the tenants that are, um, are users of this each level would have a different uh, terraces in different proportions and continuous landscape over this cascading roof that gets lower and lower, uh, closer to this uh, public piazza placed along the Casaniga. So this uh, particular configurations of starting tall along the office and spreading and lower and lower cascaded down towards the park is something that we have uh, generated particularly for this site and particularly for these projects in order to integrate the external uh, or outdoor experience into the in interior experience. So this is the view uh, that one might obtain a sitting or standing on the surface of the, the garden. And with the clients, uh, it's a great idea. Uh, perhaps we can explore further on the green houses that can grow edible vegetables. So it's also part of the uh, interlocking of these innovative office spaces and also to have an intent of the engaging uh, part of the uh, greenery, the na nature, a biophilic approach by actually utilizing it for a good purposes. Uh, so that's part of the uh, ways to integrate uh, very much of an external, the greenery experience into a foodie integrations to the inside. And that's how you perceive the building from a, a street level, the ground floor level, uh, from a public piazza looking up. So as you can get the sense that the, the heights that you would encounter along the street is ground floor height, the one story or two story height. The heights and, and the building volume that exceeding above three stories are uh, beyond, but you would experience this, the underside of the wood facing towards you. So uh, it's none of this, uh, you know, a front, uh, a frontal view of the building, of the glass uh, in a very traditional office building manner, but rather very transparent and open and very low scale, the human scale that makes this uh, project uh, unique and rather contributing to the neighborhood. And this is the view uh, if you're standing at the corner, the crossing of the street of Casaniga and uh, Via Rizzoli. So coming from the metro station, from the center of the metro, uh, Milan or else, uh, elsewhere, you would experience this uh, sense of dynamic and the uh, structural expressions of the timbers while integrated with the terracing and gardens and so on. So. Uh, once again, it's not uh, at all the typical expressions of the, the office building, but rather more open and transparent, inviting feeling uh, towards inside of the building. And 
because of this uh, linear uh, finger-like configurations that we have chosen to create, it gives like a pocket of uh, um, green garden that is full of natural lights and full of natural air. That gives this uh, sense also uh, of being uh, somewhere in between outside and inside. Um, so this is the foyer space that is also placed in between two volumes. Each tenant, all the tenants can experience this in-between space. This one is enclosed with the skylight. So uh, in a cold season or in an uncomfortable weather, uh, you can still enjoy being this sensation of being outside. And this space could be potentially used for uh, casual meetings or greetings and just uh, for uh, walking along. So it's a very spontaneous space that is very much needed uh, in our time now uh, that we learned during the COVID confinements, that this kind of breathing out uh, space is much uh, of our demands. Yeah, that's what we are looking for, Yuki, you know, for spontaneous mm. uh, situations and occasions to meet people after mm. two years of, let's say, restricted life. And I mean, it's pretty visible that the project aims at fostering a forward-looking and mm. creative model of work environment. So we are talking about office with a new perspective. And what are the core components of mm. the idea of work life that you want to mm. transmit? Yes, that's quite relative to the, uh, to the making of the architecture nowadays more than ever. Um, of course, the biophilic approach is something we had from the beginning, even before the COVID time. So I would think that we are in the right, uh, right time and right place to propose this. And even more, I, would, I have a sense that it's been more appreciated by a wider uh, clients and uh, uh, requests that we receive. So that's, that's very uh, nice, nice tendency that we get the sense that they, people need it, people desire for this kind of uh, uh, spaces. Um, so yes, I mean, it, but in order to achieve this then, uh, of course, we are not focusing on rational planning or rational building uh, uh, construction. Of course we do to the level that is achieved this creative uh, dynamic space, but it's not, it, we cannot just solve it with the, um, um, the, the office space that uh, focuses on the repetition and efficiency of the layouts and the rational to, to give a focus on the work. Uh, but it's, uh, it's no longer applicable. I mean, we, need, we, we realize that nowadays that we spend so much time at the office or workplace that it deserves, uh, and why not to be more comfortable, more inspirational, more uh, uh, innovative. And, and that leads eventually to our innovative thoughts that contributes to any companies. Um, so forward thinking is creative model for work environment is something that we strive to achieve along the line of a biophilic uh, architecture. So this uh, uh, following pages, just to highlight some of the uh, components that we made in, uh, in making of the, uh, of the building. So this diagram has been created by our collaborator, AKT. Uh, they are the engineering, very creative engineering company that we've been working with, with collaborator. Uh, so we have approached to this uh, building in a quite uh, logical way in view of also optimizing the construction sequence and materials that contributes for minimizing the carbon footprint. So um, the building has the basement, which is primarily um, built with the concrete, but for the upper level, there's a primary structure uh, that is framed with the steel and the secondary structure, uh, plain, planar elements uh, for a structural a slab. And the uh, uh, body above are, are made with a CLT engineered wood. So it's in sequence, the primary structure of uh, steel frame and CLT slabs uh, and the timber uh, layers of the buildings. Uh, it, this is the result of uh, office space that we would get. Um, uh, so it's the steel structure uh, that is uh, composing the lights enable us to achieve this uh, large span, which gives a, a quite good level of flexibility for office tenants. So that's one. And also that the structural uh, timbers uh, that is receiving and working together with the CLT, the cross laminated timber elements. So these are purely um, construction elements, but by exposing it, it's a choice of us and uh, working with the structure engineer that exposing these elements 
uh, quite honest, and the, we can achieve the maximum heights and comfortable uh, comforts to the office space inside. And also exposing this uh, uh, timba, it keeps naturally a warm, comfortable tone to the office space. Uh, so this is one image that illustrates the workspace in the office. As you can see, the space in between the work surfaces, it's full of lights. Uh, so this is how the slits between the two fingers would work. Uh, it keeps lights, it keeps natural air, and it keeps uh, this a series of timba would give a sensation of um, uh, being inside of this uh, wooden cabin uh, almost. Uh, so approaching from the street, uh, most of what you see is this uh, timba uh, floating. So it's a horizontal expression and that is quite honest and true to the structural needs and functionality. And most of it, uh, the vertical enclosures are made with glass. So it, it also gives you this uh, full transparency and openness. And every uh, open terraces receive this uh, green, um, either the ground covering or some bushes and shrubs and some uh, various trees that uh, each tenant can enjoy. Um, and that benefits to, it becomes a pleasant background for all the workspaces. Uh, yes, and this is the view from the Via Cazzaniga, uh, which is we are intentionally making all this uh, building facade quite long, so it's it approachable, it's, uh, it's human scale. Uh, to, to this uh, public piazza um, uh, for an intention of active uh, surface, creating an active, active surface, supporting the FMB outlets inside, as well as to servicing, uh, enhancing the everyday life open public spaces for uh, the neighboring, uh, the residents uh, around this uh, neighborhood. Yeah, it's great because, you know, we, you also get a very deep sense of calm when you look at the renders and then it's not just about the materials, it's also about the, the effect in terms of colors and mm. the perception that they create. So it's a, it's a very fine example of biophilic design. What I wanted to ask you is if you could please give us a better sense of the concept and also, you know, sustainability and ecology consciousness go together more and more nowadays. How are these themes interlaced and declined in Terrasse Verdi and more broadly in your design philosophy? Mm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would say biophilic design approach is not just scratching the surfaces. It's not just about uh, using the materials that is uh, natural, but it goes way beyond that. And of course, the, um, the design of in, in the intention of incorporating all this, the natural lights, water, air, is our um, intention from the beginning. But at the same time, uh, we do work um, with the certain, certain methods and the instruments and assessment tools to realize the sustainable buildings from uh, mechanical levels or the structure, construction, and, and et cetera. Uh, even for the future tenants and the clients, the owner, how we can all make this building happen not just the design aspect of it, but uh, uh, for along the process uh, from the making of the projects and also operating of the, the building upon delivery. So uh, this uh, assessment tools and method would really give us a pass forward uh, in the line of designing, the process of designing. So such as life cycle assessments that includes material analysis water consumption analysis and energy performance analysis. And of course, every step of the way in each phases, we will visit daylight analysis and acoustic to ensure that the comfort level is satisfactory uh, to an internal environment. And when you utilize the uh, instruments and tools such as lead and well, we both, uh, we are uh, striving to achieve uh, both um, as the, um, the certificate to the highest level. Um, so the energy and water strategy also is something that we have looked into with Manis, the mechanical engineer, engineer friend, and they have contributed greatly to achieve this, uh, um, the systems as well as the design uh, to reduce the demands and increase efficiency. 
and the renewable alternative sources uh, when it comes to water use. So this has been fully integrated and considered during the line of uh, mechanical design. And the material strategy and also the fact that the, we have used quite substantially uh, the, uh, um, the building elements such as beams and the uh, slabs, um, both are composed with wood in intention of minimizing the carbon footprint, but also to uh, focus on the, for instance, the recycle materials uh, that we have uh, used and kept the demolished concrete part so that the crushed uh, concrete is used for fitting, for instance. So uh, every step of the way, we have assessed and chose the method carefully to achieve this uh, sustainable appeals in ecology. And of course, uh, the building is fully covered uh, both horizontally and sometimes vertically with the greens. And that's one of the most uh, important uh, uh, design parameters for us. But also it's, uh, it's also working with the, um, the nature that we see available in the park. So the microclimate is something that we have uh, paid attention to particularly. And reducing this, uh, for sure, it, it contributes to reduce the heat island effect around the area and offsetting emission of CO2 and etc. So yeah, this uh, biophilic approach is not uh, just a design appeal, but rather uh, from the core and fundamental that we started from a scratch all along, along the way of the design phases. Yeah, I love it. Love it because, you know, at the mm. end of the day, it's all about analyses and numbers. We, we hear a lot talking about sustainability and biophilic design, but then we need to touch the facts, the numbers behind the design process. Otherwise, mm. you know, it's just marketing and love to see these slides. Thank you, Yuki. This brings me again to my other question. You know, mm. when we think of uh, Ken Gokuma and Associates, we have some keywords in our mind. We think of comfort, we think of efficiency, functionality, and of course, quality. I wanted to ask you how are these elements integrated into the design of your project? And mm. if there were some other words, keywords that you would definitely take into consideration when thinking of your design architectural mm. approach. Yes, absolutely. We, I would like to uh, shortly introduce two of the projects that we are working on in Paris office. Uh, that is, to uh, introduce other keywords besides what we have uh, kindly uh, explained uh, now. Is this biophilic? If, yes, it's a core um, ideas behind our creation. But for instance, this project, the Hans Christian Andersen, uh, which has been built, and we are uh, doing some final touch up uh, to finish up the work. But the garden, it's an ongoing work that would continue to grow and continue to to be improved over time. And so the Hans Christian Andersen, the site is in Oden, city of Odense in Denmark. It's a museum for this uh, famous writer, uh, Hans Christian Andersen. And, but it's, uh, it's quite uh, in depth that we have discussed with the museum director of, uh, of what's fundamental in the understanding of this uh, museum. It's uh, full of contradictions in uh, the ambiguity and duality. It's very complex. Uh, context that we see in them. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is that the, of course, the users, the creator uh, and the clients in each project uh, inspires us every time. So what we do, uh, what I was trying to explain at the very beginning, this micro macro scale design, it goes also in the contextual level and in conceptual intellectual level as well that we digest the uh, context, the context, concept behind, beyond the architecture vision of uh, what we could derive the uh, design of. So in this case, it was the very essence the, of the Hans Christian Andersen's uh, stories that has a lot to do with this uh, um, duality, the complexity and ambiguity uh, multi-directional narratives and journeys. So uh, what we have come up with is this uh, inside out process at the same time as outside in. So from urban scale to in architecture, but also 
a concept, a narrative of the museum, and that trans be translated to a form of architecture. Uh, on the top, of course, the, uh, the intention to create the full enjoyable outdoor space. In this case, we had the opportunity to play with the sunken exhibition space entirely placed in the underground. So this gives us the opportunity to create as maximum surface uh, that we can use as possible for a green. But also this greenery is something particular that we came up with the uh, dialogue with the landscape designers as well as the exhibition designer to create this uh, very complex form that is reflecting the exhibition experience above. So there's many parameters that we design with, but of course the um, biophilic architecture and this micro macro scale uh, is it's in parallel. So we give this uh, level of importance on all parameters of the, the projects in architectural um, approach. And in this project also that the these large surface are given and contributing to this neighborhood also, that they used to have this uh, wide boulevard that cuts into two parts of the modern development, which is a high building from this very small scale, very uh, vernacular residential scale. So our intention was to give this maximum surface of green that people can enjoy as much as possible from uh, all fronts. So uh, it is this again, very unique journey and experience view that the architecture almost as a built form disappears. So what is left is almost the journey and experience rather. So we don't uh, focus on this singular massive iconic building, but it is really for the experience and how it's, uh, it gives back to the city uh, as an open space. And some of the uh, construction uh, photos I always like, it uh, illustrates this uh, sense of ambiguity, the ambiguity. That's something that you cannot really capture in, in one glance. But in the continuation of the journey along the way, the whole experience uh, offers something completely special and different. Uh, and another key was that is quite unique in our approach is this, uh, sometimes we read the context and tradition uh, of the architecture uh, into the culture uh, and the culture to reflect and to, to have uh, innovative and new solutions for our new design of the uh, architecture. So keeping the traditions and the, uh, then implement into the new form is something we often do in all the projects and particularly this one explicitly. The last one very briefly is, uh, I, I would say also it's an exemplary of our project reading the context, micro macro scale. So designing from inside and outside. Uh, once again, this project, just like Hans Christian Andersen, it's in, set in between this small Ottoman uh, period, uh, residential buildings and this newly built uh, large scale uh, projects and the large boulevard, the busy road in front. So the project, uh, it takes on both sides. Uh, one side is this very small building that is very cute, Mandarin street and rotating building that makes this uh, a void in between the building is very, very unique and very welcoming. And also this seismic architecture, what is beautiful is this uh, taking the simple geometry and patterning them to create these complex patterns. So we took that, all these observations and implemented into this museum, modern art museum, which is built in the city of Espiche. And the area used to function as a trading timber. So Odun Pazari, which is the area name, uh, um, this museum's building, it's literally means that the wooden market. So we also took that context, implemented into our design of the building to, um, bring back or highlight the memory, celebrate the memory of the, the land, how it used to be in history. So all this context, historic, cultural, and the use, a particular use, are a drive of all our projects. And this one, we have this uh, uh, intricate ways of playing with the building, uh, the blocks that makes the various heights of the exhibition space from a tall, and wide uh, light for exhibition space to rather more intimate, uh, rational uh, layouts, but always the central volumes that defines as an atrium 
It cuts to the entire exhibition space in each level. It provides this very soft, uh, nice lights, natural lights to each uh, spaces, the exhibition spaces on the spread level. Uh, yes, so that's, uh, I hope that would uh, be a, a good part of the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, we are definitely on time and Yuki, thank you very much. I just want to share a message with our audience. If you have any question to ask, feel free to ask now because we will ask your question to Yuki. Mm -hmm. And first of all, thank you once again, because you know, it's always, always super interesting to see the behind the scene of mm -hmm. a project to know more about actually what we don't see at first. Hmm. And meanwhile, we wait maybe for some questions coming from the audience. I, I had a, a question for you, Yuki. How much importance has the technology in your projects? Because we, we see that we are going back to nature. We try to be connected, connected as much as possible with hmm. you know, the surroundings and nature. But do you see the technology as something that could be uh, embedded within this, this natural organic approach mm -hmm. and yeah. how? Absolutely, technology is, uh, is, is quite uh, an important aspect of uh, achieving also, but it should serve uh, for the good uh, towards the realizations of biophilic design, uh, any technologies that contributes for, um, for supporting that idea, uh, we would look into it for sure. And from the mechanical viewpoints, the selections of the uh, uh, the machines or the equipments that would support and enable us to to further investigate is something that we are keen in looking into. Absolutely. Great. Um, mm. We got a question which is about you know uh, the materials, and they're asking uh, how is how much is important the choice of materials in your projects? How much do they affect? Mm. Mm -hmm. affect the, the project? Uh, yes, the material and the finishes, uh, how it's put together is uh, one of the most important um, design uh, aspect of our project, yes. And just like in the terrasability project, our uh, way of dealing with the uh, material is something that is honest, uh, uh, as much as possible untreated to the uh, natural state of the material itself. And also not just the finish, uh, but to be functionally used and employed as a structural or something that is functional, something that's needed. In, uh, uh, and so we don't work with much of an excess though. Uh, so we would try to be as honest and fundamental and as, uh, as minimum as possible when it comes to uh, use of material and also the choosing the finish uh, of the material. Great. And I, I pick a couple of questions more from our q &A chat. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, you know, comes from Chile and they, Franco is asking if the concepts of biophilic architecture and ma micro, macro uh, approach are global, to all the projects. So if the principles you were talking about when talking about biophilic architecture is something that you can apply on a global scale and what are the criteria, if they are specific to the local project or they can be applied to anywhere in the world? Uh, I would think that the, for instance, biophilic approach is, uh, is applicable. Yes, absolutely. Micro micro scale is, uh, it's not a matter of applicable. I think it's more matter of a focus though. Uh, we read the context being that the, how the site is situated and um, we initiate the project uh, regardless of what, uh, no exceptions. Uh, we do investigate a lot uh, on the uh, culture and the program, uh, in this case, for instance, a museum. So we, do under, we, we need to do a lot of research and understanding the needs, type of art that to be exhibited. So that's, uh, and yeah, the, um, that leads us to the experience inside. So it's not that we only look out from outside to the start designing, but we do simultaneously. That's what I meant by a micro macro scale approach. So inside out and outside in, in a very uh, um, simultaneous manner. 
um, but also this uh, given importance of how the materials are defined in the space and how it is experienced is part of this uh, micro macro approach too. So yes, I mean, we do uh, apply this uh, concept and method uh, for the, all the projects, I would say. Great. I, I have now another question and they're asking um, if there is any difference in doing a project in Milan comparing with other cities in the world. I think this comes from a Milanese. <laughs> we have many challenges, yes, but like many other projects, different challenges, I would say. But the, what we have done, uh, this is the, our second project uh, to, to build. The first one was the Lodi uh, University. And uh, since then, we have learned a lot, though, uh, doing a project in, uh, in Italy and in, uh, Milan. Uh, of the, uh, there's, there's a lot of highly educated uh, professionals, uh, engineers, and the contractors that is a bit similar to, I would say, Japanese way of approaching the construction culture. We have a uh, quite deep history of a craftsmanship. So uh, roofers or the, uh, the stone people, and they are all come from this uh, uh, background of the deep history of crafts. So these uh, high appreciations and the developed knowledge and skills uh, of this. So that's something that we appreciate very much in, uh, in Italy. And Milan is just uh, highlighting all this like design consciousness. Uh, people are very design oriented. So not just the designers or architects, but everyone like clients and they are very keen of achieving a very high quality uh, design. So that's really new and that's very nice. Uh, and also dealing with the uh, uh, authorities, uh, something very special that the people are very sensitive about what to be implemented in the, in, in the land. So we, have, uh, we had a very good dialogue with these um, authorities and that was really interesting <laughs> to engage. Uh, as an outsider, as a foreign architect, to to create this, to have this discussion, uh, in focusing in history and urban context and so on. So that was something uh, very particular in Milan, I would say. That, that's great to hear you. Yeah. Uh, we still have seven minutes. If it's fine for you, I will ask you a few more questions. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Tani Zorn uh, is asking us how did the engineers influence the design of the building. Hmm. It's, yes, I mean, we do work very well with the particular structure engineer, the AKT uh, from London, that we almost uh, create the design together, though. It's not that we, they implement our design and we implement their uh, engineer, but we work very much together from the very beginning. So we don't force the idea that is not necessary or not excessive uh, to the structure, but uh, we do from a scratch and to come up with the uh, scheme. So in, to that extent, uh, I would say our collaboration, collaboration is quite fundamental and the most essential part of uh, realizing these uh, projects. Okay, and mm -hmm. James is asking, how do you handle and guide the client about the aging of materials over time? Mm. Since wood is beautiful as it ages, but the building typology of office may be not appropriate for aging. Hmm. Uh, yes, I mean, we. that's one thing that we are quite fortunate and I'm very happy to have this client to work with so say that they have uh, in, in line with our view of the aging, the grain of the uh, wood is something very beautiful and to be appreciated. But to that extent, of course, we do take all the measures, the necessary measures uh, to prevent uh, uh, direct exposure to uh, rainwater as less as possible by cantilever in the roof, particularly to the terra severity projects, and also to apply the, um, the ad adequate uh, treatments uh, when it comes to uh, engineering wood and grain is always uh, vulnerable parts. So we do investigate with the manufacturer, with the contractor, the best way to protect the wood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, aging is a factor, but it's only possible to realize uh, with the clients who would appreciate the, uh, the aging aspect of the wood. Yeah, I agree, I love it too. Mm. And mm -hmm. I think I got a, a last question for you, which is probably the, the more interesting, let's say, for who is waiting for the project. 
when do you think the project will be completed? Hmm. <laughs> Good question. Uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> but I I need to yeah I need to set aside that, that question though um, <laughs> because it's in progress and we need to uh, be online with the clients and contractors setting forward. So yeah, as soon as possible. I hope. Because we can't wait, of course, to see it in in the real life. Hmm. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, we try our best to accelerate the the period as soon as we can. Thank you, Yuki. I, I think we are done with the questions. And I, I don't know if Roberto wants to join us for a final greeting to our audience, but it's been a great talk by you. So mm. thank you once again. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, uh, I would like to, can you hear me, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. Yeah, I asked Yuki if in the meantime can interrupt to share the screen. And uh, really, uh, congratulations and thank you, Yuki, because uh, I'm really impressed uh, discovering how this project uh, is really an extraordinary project. So really, congratulations. And uh, just uh, before uh, ending with this episode, uh, I would like to say thank you again to our sponsor, Atmosfera, Outdoor Furniture, and to our uh, media partner. And uh, then, uh, if you missed uh, some part of you want to rewatch it, because I saw that uh, some uh, of our attendees asked if, it's, uh, if the presentation will be available. Of course, all the registration of the video will be available on medland.com in the next days. So don't worry about that. And I remind you that uh, Medland is the members only platform for the design industry leaders. So feel, uh, feel free to apply for a membership uh, to be part of Medellin uh, and our team will review it uh, and uh, we'll uh, come back to you in uh, one day. And uh, nothing more, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, streaming. Thank you again, Yuki. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Yuki, I hope to see you soon, uh, see you soon in Milan. I, I see if, it, um, because it was a pleasure to meet you in our new Spazio Medellin, this, this space, uh, the place dedicated to the architect and designers members of uh, of Medellin. I don't know if you can just stop sharing the screen. I can. Uh, uh, we can uh, go with the outro and just uh, uh, saying uh, hello to the and see you to the next uh, to the next uh, episode. Patrick, you want to to add some something? No, I think you already said a lot, and I mean was here mostly to listen to Yuki and thank you once again for the invitation and it's always great to see these, these projects uh, really, with the protagonists. Thank you Patrick to moderate also this episode of uh, Extraordinary. Thank you really again uh, Yuki and uh, to all the Kengo Kuma team really and uh, see you soon and uh, take care. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.